I am Melissa Brown Godal. I am the deputy director of the Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies, which is, and I have to, I just before I go any further, hi Jane, my very first boss at Yale University back in the 1990s is with us today, which is really exciting. <laughs> um, no pressure at all. <laughs> um, so we're here today for a panel on how elite universities have benefited from, under, uh, excuse me, have used benefited from and understood the story of enslavement in North America. And um, I'm here to welcome you on behalf of the Macmillan Center. I had a very, a fabulous question on why Gilder Lerman Center and Macmillan Center are in a, a long-term relationship together. And so I'm gonna touch on that briefly. Um, but I wanted to just sort of um, start with a slightly more personal note, which is why I, which is um, that I started uh, in this position in August of this past year. I have been around Yale since the 1990s on and off in various positions, but I've had a long history with Yale that actually predates my employment here, which is where my family, there's, there's seats right here if you'd like to come down. Uh, my family came to um, New Haven in the 1970s and right away we started going to Connecticut Hall, which is one of the oldest buildings in Connecticut. And it's an icon of the Yale campus. Um, and as I was reflecting on this and my own history, the reason we were going there is because Quaker meeting was there. And so we would go every Sunday there. And I looked into this uh, when I was preparing for this, because, of course, it's such a historical icon for Yale. And I thought, OK, well, let's look into this. John Trumbull, the designer who has a residential college named after him, uh, he designed the building and built the building and was, of course, uh, an owner of enslaved Africans and used enslaved Africans to help support the building of that building. And I thought, oh, what a paradox. The Quakers convening in this space, you know, there's a lot of work to be done here. And then I actually looked into it a little bit more and learned that Quakers were actually among the first slave traders before they become became the notable mm -hmm. abolition, abolitionists that they ultimately were, which was humbling. Um, and it's important at that moment to be honest and to be humble and to work toward a better future. Uh, a better today and a better tomorrow. So that brings us where, to where we are now. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of context about the Gilder Lerman Center and the Macmillan and why we have this relationship. And then we'll jump into the panel. Um, the Gilder Lerman Center, the mission is to support academic excellence in the study of slavery and its enduring legacies, make, the, make this knowledge freely available to the public and foster work towards social justice. Um, this happens to be the 25th anniversary of Gilder Lerman. It is the oldest organization of its kind. And it is the first, it was the first academic center in the world to focus on the international history of slavery and its enduring legacies. And it, it really, it, uh, uh, the, looking through the literature and talking to the team here, it, it, the, the two main facets that we see it supports scholarship, so research fellowships, publications, convening, um, but it also supports public education and outreach for broad audiences. And this is so important, particularly in this time in history, when it's so challenging in certain areas to do this type of very important education, to have the resources available. Um, and we'll hear from David, who happens to be a public school educator historically uh, from Flint, Michigan. <laughs> um, previous life. Previous life. <laughs> But still, it's going to be a blast. Um, so then why Macmillan, which is a wonderful question. Um, the Macmillan Center is, our mission is to pursue excellence in research, teaching, and I just rewrote this, which is just why I'm having to use a cheat sheet. I'll memorize it by next year. Uh, but in research, <laughs> teaching, and capacity building across societies to bring about a more informed, inclusive, and flourishing world. And the thing is, in this day and age, slavery and oppression and racism are still very necessary topics to be discussing every single day. They are not gone and they are international. And so that is why we have this relationship and why it's so important that we have these connections because there is a conversation to be had around this. Um, we are, our, our priorities as a center are humanity, dignity, good governance, environment, climate change, social resilience, and leadership and service. And all of these things connect intimately to the priorities set by the Gilder Lerman Center. Um, and I will say our values too connect to it, which is academic excellence, disciplinarity, collaboration and community, diversity, inclusivity, equality, 
curiosity and impact. Um, and I have to say, when I shared all these, I, I, these, these, these priorities and these values have gone through various iterations of stakeholder engagement. Michelle sent the most un-Michelle email I've ever seen, which was, I don't have any comments, because it does connect directly to what Gil Dollerman does. Um, it is a compliment. It is a very, it was a, a it could be, and I usually count on her to tell me what changes I need to make. So it's fabulous. Um, so um, getting to today's panel, we're here to discuss the role of our institutions. That light just got really bright, not sure why. Um, but we're here to discuss um, our, the role of elite institutions um, in this narrative. And I'm delighted to introduce David. I think most of the folks in this know, in room know David Blight, but he was a public school educator uh, in Flint, Michigan before becoming a college professor. Uh, he is the Sterling Professor of History and the, a director of the Gilder Lerman Center. Um, he is in 2020, Peter Sal President Peter Salovey asked David to lead a study of Yale's historical connections to slavery and abolition. And he formed a group and he's done a lot of work along those lines. I'll let him speak to that. But I also have to acknowledge for those who don't know, um, David published a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, biography on Frederick Douglass. If you'd like to see a copy of it, it's in our common room upstairs. It never goes away. It's front and center in our bank of books. It's an amazing book. Um, and he is the lead author on the forthcoming publication, Yale and Slavery, a History, which is a narrative history of Yale's historic involvement and associations with slavery and its aftermaths. Um, and it will be published officially in February by Yale University Press. Uh, so we look forward to a batch of programming getting the word out there about the important work that David and his team have done. And without further ado, I will pass the mic to David. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, thank you so much, Michelle, for bringing uh, Melissa. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to... <laughs> but, uh, that's not the first time I've made them. Uh, <laughs> Melissa, uh, for bringing the imprimatur here of the Macmillan Center, under which we've served for 25 years. And the aforementioned Michelle is Michelle Zacks, who's our associate director and kind of runs everything we do. Um, and will be reminding me to stay to time. Um, yes, I was the lead writer. Yes, I was asked to lead this and so forth and so on. But we had a remarkable team. And I want to dispense with that as quickly as I can, because we brought some really distinguished people here to talk about this more broadly. But uh, the first thing I did was to go to Michael Moran at the Beinecke and scream help. Uh, and uh, then we got Michael Lotstein and the un university librarian uh, who has been an enormous help. Um, and then um, the president and the president's office first loaned us and then permanently gave us uh, Hope McGrath, who is also here today to uh, help coordinate all of the research on this. Uh, and a, a very special thanks to uh, Susan Gibbons, the president's chief of staff, and others in the president's office because they sponsored this. They initiated it, they sponsored it, and uh, they paid all the research assistants uh, over time. We started with a whole array of student research assistants, which, you know, Students do what students do. <laughs> they get degrees and they leave. And sometimes they leave when they don't get degrees. But um, we finally boiled our researchers down to three or four real pros under the guidance of Hope McGrath and Mike Moran um, uh, to, to finish this book last summer. Um, it's an enormous... You know, chronology, Yale is over 300 years old. We stopped in 1915, and uh, when you read the book, you'll see why, I hope. Um, we're under an embargo, so-called, uh, about speaking uh, about our findings, but uh, some of those findings are somewhat already known. Um, there are many other people who helped us with this, including the members of the New Haven community, uh, two of them are here. Uh, Joy Burns, I saw you walk in. You might just wave your hand. There you are. Um, who used to work at the Yale, the Yale Medical School, but is a, uh, a, a an enormously important local historian uh, and has, has been a 
big player in this. And then especially Charles Warner, who is sitting over here next to Mike Moran, who uh, is uh, many things, uh, including uh, a local New Haven historian, historian of black New Haven, historian of the black religious history of New Haven. And in fact, Charles will be doing a podcast with me next week with Peter Salovey. I hope you know about that. And, and okay, yeah. <laughs> good. <laughs> they just sent us the questions today, so you know. Anyway, uh, and thank you all for coming. Enormous turnout. We have a large audience also online. It's being live streamed. And welcome to all of you wherever you are in the country or the world. Um, a couple words about our project, and then I want to introduce our our guests. Each of them is going to take about five to seven minutes, we will be timing you, uh, to give their current take from the various perspectives we have here today on this question of universities and slavery, uh, now a 20-some year phenomenon in the study of the subject, although it's older than that, as we'll hear from Scott Spellman, whose book goes back to 1750. Um, but first, uh, Melissa used the word humble. And, you know, it's not, humility, humility has not been exactly in vogue in the United States in recent times. But you can't take on a project like this. Uh, any projects, frankly, any historian writing about anything should have somewhere at the top of their principles a notion of humility. Uh, one of my favorite historians and, and, a, and a mentor to me, uh, the late Nathan Huggins, wrote this in his Who's Who entry. Now, nobody does Who's Who anymore, but Nathan did. He said, I find in the study of history the special discipline which forces me to consider peoples and nations not my own. It is the most human, it is the most human of disciplines, and in so many ways, the most humbling, for we cannot ignore those who, those of the future, who will judge us in the same way. Whatever you write, somebody's out there waiting to judge us, as we judge. We judge, and we will be judged. And uh, my dear friend, Mike Moran, is always quoting St. Augustine, and I do too. Uh, among my favorite and many favorite lines from Augustine is, if you build a tower that touches the clouds, root its foundation in humility. Now, having said that, our book is full of judgments. <laughs> uh, it's a narrative history. It's not a report. Nothing wrong with the reports. Most universities have done reports of various kinds and, and lengths and different kinds of substances for different purposes, perhaps. But from day one, I didn't want to write a report. I wanted to write a real history. It was a foolish notion at first, and it was terrifying for the first year, year and a half, because I had no idea how we would control this. But my colleagues certainly helped. And it needs to be said that the Yale book, when it comes out in February, you'll see this, have a look at the footnotes, because somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of all of our sources are right from the Yale libraries. It is a story that has been hiding in plain sight for as long as we've had libraries. And there are dozens and dozens of histories of Yale. Uh, and Mike Moran does an amazing presentation over at the Beinecke sometimes where he actually lines up on carts all these histories of Yale. And then we kind of point to the three that ever mentioned slavery, or four, maybe five. Now, that's not that surprising when you go back into these contexts and you look. But it's still a little stunning um, when you first look. Colleges and universities are among, quote, the slowest changing institutions in American life. That's a line from Andy Del Banco's book called College which is, I think, one of the best books written about what colleges and universities are, at least in recent years. They are, he says, quote, slower even than the post office. Our study, well, in recent days, we've seen the universities sometimes act 
rather quickly about something, <laughs> whether they need to or not, I don't know. Our study of Yale and slavery may only reinforce that perception of the slowness of universities. But as we have seen with so many universities and small colleges looking seriously into their past with race, slavery, and beyond, perhaps a fruitful crossroads has now been reached in how institutions of higher learning now approach the construction or reconstruction of their own institutional memory and their own identities. Even more so, we're experiencing a reckoning with the very idea of the changing mission or purpose of colleges and universities, as well as the changing purposes of secondary and primary schools, of curriculum, the freedom to read and learn without religiously or politically driven censorship, an issue all around us. The idea of the free university, inside and outside of its gates, its pursuits of diversity, its attempted meritocracy, its curriculums, and its business models, are undergoing scrutiny and pressure in new ways the Puritan founders of this place could not possibly recognize. The American college or university is a profoundly important American reinvention of an ancient idea. Remade in medieval times in Italy, Germany, and Britain, and elsewhere, and then recreated again in colonial America, the modern American public school as well, and university, public school and university, may be the single most democratic institution the United States has ever created. I would argue that. I'm a product of public school. I don't have an education without public school. Even as it has always been the public school, a laboratory of both social mobility and economic and racial inequality. Among Americans' most treasured values, and we have a lot of them, but think about them. Among our most treasured values is that a higher education can remake one's life. As endangered as such a great ideal may be, who involved in education or aspiring to it does not want to or need to believe in that gospel that a university can remake your life. Um, we've been asked a hundred times now, or a thousand times, what, what among your findings and what among your research most surprised you? And I got my own long list, and so do others who worked on this. But to me, it's been a rediscovery of what the university is for, the function of this place. The pursuit of those ideals that we kind of are afraid to mouth sometimes, like truth. Although the Trump era brought the word truth back with vengeance, we actually use it now. We didn't used to. Um, it's renewed my faith that uh, an institution like this can actually create, sponsor, and execute study of itself when it's very uncomfortable. Uh, and the results are uncomfortable at times. And I should say also the sponsors of this, President of Yale and his team, the board, never once tried to control one word that we wrote. Uh, the rollout of the book coming in a few months, another matter, that <laughs> very much, well, understandably so. Uh, but every word in this book is freely written. And I must say too, two of the chapters were written by Hope McGrath, the two late 19th century chapters, and the chapter in the 1831 Black College effort here at Yale was written by uh, Mike Moran. Uh, we edited each other until we couldn't stand it anymore. <laughs> and the good news is, despite editing each other way too much, we're still good friends. Anyway, now to this panel uh, and why we're doing it. Uh, it's uh, a thrill to welcome um, a new friend and some old friends. Let me start with Scott Spillman at the end of the table. Scott is currently a visiting fellow here, has been here all semester at the Gilder Lehrman Center. 
He's an independent scholar at present uh, who is based in Denver, Colorado. He's originally from Atlanta. He uh, uh, went to college at UNC Chapel Hill, and uh, he did his PhD at Stanford. We've got more than one Stanford yeah. PhD here today. Uh, this fall, he's been finishing his book, and I can say if he doesn't say it for himself, we, we don't always have visiting fellows with the, the last week of their time with us can say, I just turned my book in. He just turned his book in. So, um, with Thank basic you. books, by the way, that's uh, not shabby. Uh, he used his time here at the Gilda Lehrman Center to finish the manuscript entitled Making Sense of Slavery in American History. Which exam and I'm going to let him tell you much more about it in a moment. It examines the individuals, the institutions, and the ideas that have been involved in the study of slavery uh, from before the American Revolution, actually, all the way to the present. Uh, that's a big subject, and I still don't know quite how he pulled that off. But we've been thrilled to have Scott here, and Scott's book was in many ways what stimulated us to pull together the rest of this panel and have a broader discussion, not only of how slavery historiography evolved in American universities and elsewhere, but then why are universities doing this? And the rest of our panel know a lot about that. Leslie Harris to my right is professor of history and African-American studies at Northwestern University. Uh, she spent a good deal of her career, 20 years, I think, at Emory University. Uh, she is one of the top public historians of these matters of slavery and race uh, anywhere. She played a major role in the two uh, famous exhibitions at the New York Historical Society on slavery in New York. If any of you remember those, it was in the aughts. Leslie, along with the late Jim Horton, were the, were the key advisors on that. Uh, she's the author of The Shadow of Slavery, African Americans in New York City, and she, uh, most recently, with uh, Jim Campbell at Stanford and Al Brophy at the University of Alabama, edited the, the, the best, well, really the first, and the best collection of essays about this issue of slavery and universities. It's called Slavery and the Universities, Histories and Legacies, uh, a book that was incredibly valuable to me in thinking about how to introduce and write an epilogue on our book. Um, she's also worked in public history in Savannah, Georgia, in New Orleans, her hometown, and she's now writing a book called Leaving New Orleans, A Personal Urban History, a book that combines uh, her family, uh, the genre of memoir, if it's safe yes. to say it is, yes, and a history of New Orleans. Uh, so that's that's going to be a dynamite book, I think. <laughs> anyway, and, and Leslie's been here before at the GLC and, and many other places on this subject. But, uh, oh, and last but not least, in her years at Emory, she ran the project at Emory University to study its past, which is very complicated being a Georgia institution, um, which was actually founded elsewhere on a plantation. Anyway, uh, she ran that project for, for Emory. Um, and Rachel Swarns, uh, down the table, uh, is a journalism professor at NYU. Uh, she has for over 20 years uh, been a correspondent and a reporter for the New York Times. Uh, she's written on many, many subjects, but it was particularly her articles on Georgetown University's roots in slavery that touched off uh, a big, some, many of you will remember, a national conversation about American universities and slavery, particularly those who actually owned slaves and sold them, which is precisely what uh, Georgetown did in the 1830s. Her recent book, The 272, The Families Who Were Enslaved and Sold to Build the American Catholic Church by Random House, uh, it just came out less than a year ago. Yeah. Uh, I had the privilege of reviewing it for the New York Times. It is a dynamite book uh, of, of narrative history and of deep digging, serious research, and wonderful narrative history, because ultimately it becomes the story of the descendants uh, who ended up out in, um, well, the deep south, the southwest. Um, she's also done uh, uh, an amazing work called The Unseen, 
uh, unpublished Black History from the New York Times photo archives. Check that out if you haven't already. And uh, anyway, uh, it's a thrill to have her. I mean, when I reviewed the book and we got in touch, I said, we're going to have you to Yale and, you know, do a, do, a, do a thing, do a talk or something. And then I started to think about, let's let's build a group around her, too. So <laughs> between Scott and Rachel, I decided to do this panel. And last but hardly least, Craig Wilder uh, is the Weller Professor of History at uh, MIT. Uh, he's also the senior fellow of the Bard Prison Initiative. Uh, Craig wears lots of hats. Uh, uh, he's written many books and uh, many works, but especially, and it is it is the first and still most important by any means, book on universities and slavery called Ebony and Ivy. Uh, it is the book anyone has to start with, frankly, if you're interested in this subject. Uh, Ebony and Ivory, Race, Slavery, and the Troubled History of America's Universities. Um, he's also been the leader of the MIT and Slavery Project. He's also the leader of the MIT and Indigenous History Project. Lest you think MIT has just been a bunch of engineers pushing buttons all these years. <laughs> they have a long, uh, if you like, hidden history as well and craig was a, a, a main play, as was leslie we're both main players in our uh, big conference we did here uh in 2021 on universities and slavery and yale and slavery and also just one of the historians i have so long most admired for his seriousness his perspective and his ability to write in fact, last point, and I'm going to turn it over to them. When you read Ebony and Ivory, don't stop. Oh, well, of course. <laughs> Ivy. What did I say? Ivory? Ebony and Ivy. I do that all the time. Anyway, um, read that last chapter on colonization. Because... That's where Yale really comes into play. I mean, you use, you use the Yale sources elsewhere in your book, Craig. But when you get to that colonization story, as it's evolving in the 1820s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, if you're going to understand Yale's presence in this story, and there were many different kinds of Yale people on this question, but it was this moderation, this effort to find the middle ground, to try to imagine a future that would not be biracial in the United States through theories and practices of removing people. Um, that chapter on colonization is the best thing written on colonization in recent years. And it's interesting that it, it took up the question of universities in order to do that. Now, each of them gets five to seven minutes. And I'm going to start with Scott, since he's writing this book about uh, 300 and some years, um, to tell us what you're doing, Scott. And then we'll just kind of go in... Oh, I'll pick an order after I hear your voice. <laughs> sure. That sounds good. Uh, thanks, David, for that, your first. for that introduction. And thanks to everyone at the Gilder Lehrman Center and the Macmillan sure. Center for hosting me this fall and for putting on this event. Uh, I first got into this subject uh, through the work of David Brian Davis, who was the founding director of the Gilder Lehrman Center. And so it is truly an honor to be able to finish this book uh, while at the Gilder Lehrman Center. Um, as David mentioned, my book is called uh, Making Sense of Slavery. And it tells the story of how uh, American scholars, Americans in general, have studied slavery from uh, the 1750s until today. Uh, one of the points that I, I make in the book is that reckoning with slavery is, is nothing new in American life, certainly not in American intellectual life. Uh, it's been there from the start in a variety of different ways and at different moments. Um, the study of slavery has both uh, reflected the contours of American life and in, in many cases has shaped those contours. Uh, I go through the, as David mentioned, ideas, institutions, individuals involved uh, at, at some detail, more detail than my editor would like. Um, but, <laughs> but I'll just give a, a sort of brief overview here as maybe background for our discussion. So I, I get started in, in the 1750s looking at why and how I see the study of slavery starting at that moment, growing out of sort of broader enlightenment studies of society. 
and then follow that story through the revolution and the early republic. Importantly, at a moment when slavery still exists in America to be observed, to be experienced, to be debated. Uh, we don't always think about it this way, but these debates depend uh, in at least some extent for some of the people involved on the study of slavery. People who are looking at slavery, looking at evidence about slavery to make arguments about what slavery is and what role it plays in the society and economy. Um, and this is happening as slavery is simultaneously expanding across the Old Southwest and coming to an end in the North. And at a time when slavery is increasingly uh, the subject of uh, contentious debates and ultimately uh, violent conflict, a conflict that, that in fact ends slavery in the Civil War. And so that's when the second part of my book starts is during and after the Civil War with the end of slavery with emancipation, because the end of slavery fundamentally changes the way that slavery is studied. Slavery is no longer around to be observed or experienced, but people still have questions about it. You know, what was slavery? What role did slavery play in the coming of the Civil War? What role had slavery played in American history? And at first, people address these questions through memory, people who had lived through the slavery debates, who had lived through the Civil War. But then as those events recede farther into the past, increasingly they do it through research, including historical research. And they do it at a new institution in American life, the Modern Research University, which takes shape in the 1870s and 1880s first, and most fully at Johns Hopkins. Uh, but then it gets kind of appended on to older colleges, uh, most significantly for my story at places like Columbia and Yale. And what's new about the modern research university is that it's dedicated to the production of new knowledge, not just the passing down of old knowledge. And so this new generation of professional scholars in the research university take up the study of slavery. And these are people who have sort of grown up in the shadow of the Civil War. They've seen that slavery as a subject of national politics causes nothing but conflict uh, for at least a generation, if not a century before. And so one thing that they do um, as they're trying to be sort of these objective, dispassionate scholars is that they take slavery out of the story of national politics in America. Uh, they drain politics and morality out of the study of slavery. They look at, at it through a lens that is legalistic and then eventually more social and economic in orientation. And they also take it out of the national story of American history and make it into sort of a province of Southern history. And this is happening at, at roughly the same time in the 1890s and early 1900s when Northern politicians and national politicians are sort of washing their hands of the so-called Negro problem, the problem of race relations in America and giving it back to the South to solve. Uh, the same thing is happening in the study of slavery. And the person who represents the culmination of these trends is um, a man named Ulrich B. Phillips, uh, the first professional scholar of slavery in the United States. He worked here at the end of his career. And in his most influential book, American Negro Slavery in 1918, he advanced an interpretation of slavery that saw slavery as a benign or indeed beneficent institution, a school for the civilization of supposedly barbarous and childlike Africans in America, and moreover, one that would have sort of died out gradually and peacefully if there had never been a civil war. This is the dominant interpretation of slavery through the first half of the 20th century in the United States. But it's important to note that it, it's never without challenge. Um, those challenges are there from the very beginning. And so in the third part of my book, I, I look at those challenges and how they build to ultimately undermine and overturn that interpretation of slavery. So I look at things like ideas, uh, coming out of cultural modernism, social and political changes uh, resulting from the Great Migration, um, new ideas about freedom, race, and democracy growing out of the Great Depression and World War II, and also the, the broader uh, democratization, diversification, and expansion of American higher education. All of this allows Phillips's interpretation of slavery to be undermined in the 20s and 30s, 
overturned in the 40s and 50s, and then for a new interpretation of slavery to take shape in the 60s and 70s against the backdrop of the civil rights movement and black power, uh, an interpretation in which it's not only possible, but uh, often seen as necessary to approach slavery from the perspective of the enslaved, and in which scholars once again see slavery as central to the story of American history. And all of this is in place roughly by the time of the National Bicentennial in 1976. Mm -hmm. And so that's when the, the final part of my book picks up. Uh, and I look at the question of, so with slavery then seen as central to American history, at least among academic scholars, does that change the broader story of American history? Does it change how we think about American democracy or American freedom? Uh, and if so, how? That's one question that, that comes up. And then the second one is, can or should scholars then take this story out to the broader public, whether that's through their books, through public history, through other kinds of programs? And it seems to me that those questions, you can see them as animating the culture wars of the 80s and 90s. You can see them more recently in the past five or 10 years in the discussions that we've been having about slavery in the public sphere. And it seems to me that they're, they're very much still with us today. Um, but I'm going to end here because I think we'll discuss them quite a bit more uh, as we get into this issue of how and why universities have been investigating their, their own relationship to slavery over the past two decades or so. Uh, Scott, thank you for the fast flight through 300 years. Uh, in fact, if and I'll hold back on questions, but it, if you can bring the public to reading about the nature of historiography, you deserve prizes just for that. I mean, because, you know, we're always thinking, well, they don't understand what we do. I don't know. It, and they don't actually. Uh, Leslie, would you go? Yeah, next? absolutely. Okay. Um, first, thanks for inviting me here today. It's always a pleasure and an honor to be at Yale and particularly under the auspices of the Gilder Lehrman Center. I also want to thank Yale for being uh, kind of inaugurating the field very quietly and then going away <laughs> and then coming back now in this 25th year of the center and um, with this book, which I can't wait to really read and engage with. I want to, in a way, pick up where Scott left off, which is uh, a few decades after 70, uh, 1976, but what led universities to begin examining their histories of slavery? And certainly my experience at Emory, at Brown, what I witnessed at Alabama was contemporary issues. People began um, uh, thinking at Emory about the issues of race and diversity on campus because of a really difficult year around all of those issues in um, at that moment. But of course, it wasn't the first time there had been a difficult year either at Emory or in an American university. And I want to say a name that I hadn't thought about in a while, but both at Emory and at Brown, a man named David Horowitz was also key. And I think in this particular moment, it's important to bring him back to this moment of struggle because he was very clearly anti-affirmative action. He had his 10, thing, 10 reasons why Black Americans should not um, be, uh, I think, gifted, he would probably say, with affirmative action, including the fact that a civil war had been fought to end slavery and had enough white people died. I'm paraphrasing, but only very slightly. These kinds of issues on American universities led many people to look at where they lived and where they worked and at the meaning of the university and to say, what are we doing wrong? Why are we, as you might say today, why are we arguing? Why are we, what are we fighting about? At Emory, we had this series of uh, uh, really uh, pitched uh, battles, discussions, arguments in public, and a group of us got together and said, some of us said, this is the undertow that we've always talked about that's emerging. Uh, 
And other people said, I didn't know there was racism here. What are you talking about? Where's the data? My friends in poli sci who joined with me in this project. I will say though, that they stuck with me and with all of us who became involved in this question of how do you track what has happened here? How do you figure out not only what the history of race and racism has been, and it began with African-Americans for some of the reasons I've laid out, but it grew to embrace other groups. How do you track that history of then and how do we understand what's happening now? Emory, as many elite institutions, had perfect numbers, great representation, and nobody could talk to each other about the issues that were at the very center of the university at that moment. So we got together and began researching, and that within the university became a community project. What's our evidence? The basic kinds of questions we all ask as researchers and as teachers with our students. How do we figure out what happened here? What have people already said about this? What are we experiencing now and how do we track that as well? What is our current experience, not just in numbers, but how do we understand this thing called campus diversity? At Emory, this project, one of the most incredible uh, almost decade of my life called the Transforming Community Project, evolved out of these hot button issues. We really wanted to understand our campus and what we could do differently. As individuals and institutions, we wanted to live and experience and be in a diverse community together. We wanted, I um, many years later said, we wanted to understand community as a verb. Not as something that because you happen to be in the same geographic place, everything's going to work out, but you have to work at community. You have to find a common language, a common understanding of what you're experiencing. Not, um, as I put it, you don't have to be on the same page, but can we at least get in the same library? <laughs> and that was our goal, was to give people some of just the basic facts of things that had happened at Emory and how they reflected the nation. We also wanted people to be more comfortable with being uncomfortable. And we still, as you know, struggle with this. Safety is a, 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 a trigger word for me on college campuses at many times, and particularly in these early years. I think we sometimes confuse safety with discomfort. Learning is often uncomfortable. I wish I were more comfortable with speaking French. I'm not. That's a simplistic thing, but when we talk about these issues of race and slavery and our experiences with them or our past, our ancestry, there is going to be discomfort. I watch my students in courses that I teach on slavery suddenly realizing that ancestor whose picture is in our room, what was their relationship to slavery, to Jim Crow? And those are uncomfortable moments, but they're not unsafe. So we did a lot of work around getting people in diverse groups to talk about these histories, to think about their place in history, and to develop that muscle of being uncomfortable, but persisting through that discomfort, which is key to all kinds of difficult learning. My mother's a math teacher is another example of a similar issue. Some of the <laughs> outcomes in the institution was more capacity around civil engagement. And after five years of running these kinds of projects where people met in groups and discussed the history, some people took on research projects, some people became artists and took on art projects. We had all kinds of things blooming on campus. There was just more capacity around civil engagement around these issues. People also grew their leadership. We suddenly had this middle group of people who had the ability to go into a situation and help people dialogue instead of fight, if you know what I mean. That was incredibly empowering to see and was not something we expected. We also, I think, explored what research is, particularly historical research, of course. And our program was open to everyone on campus and alumni in the community. But we, we, we realized, of course, not everyone are faculty and students. And our staff often didn't have access to the kinds of things that we were experiencing. And so all of our groups were open to staff. In fact, most people who came to our um, groups were staff. <laughs> And they got to engage in some of the things that as faculty and students, we experience every day. So we, we tried to create, it's, it wasn't the only thing, I wanna say it was not definitely not the only thing that was needed to address issues of diversity on campus, but it did begin to get more of us into 
creating a common language, to being excited about these issues, to not being afraid about them. And sometimes in these institutions, there's this discomfort, there's something under the surface and no one's putting their finger on it. And everyone's kind of on edge. By bringing some of this into the light, a lot of people suddenly went, aha, and then they had an opportunity to do something constructive. Now, I want to say something about today. Hopefully, I still have a little bit of time. Ahead, and my involvement in this project as a fairly <laughs> new associate professor who had never thought about administration seriously, it led me to open my eyes to the vast inequalities within our academic communities. And here I'm talking about the communities of institutions everywhere in our nation and how they affect our world. These institutions, as you know very well, are not ivory towers. They are often the largest employers in the cities or communities in which they're in. They often hold the hopes for fulfilling life for millions of individuals, for their families and for themselves. We have a responsibility to take those roles seriously as leaders in our communities, and we are just by the nature of how many people we employ and because we embody so many hopes. Right now, the general public focuses only on certain parts of this vast ecology of higher education, undergraduate admissions, and diversity. And you know that we do a lot more than that. There is no attention to what would happen if these schools were undermined to the point that, for example, mm, they stopped developing drugs like the COVID-19 vaccine. There is no attention to what would happen if we stopped researching cancer, if we stopped researching into the law and thinking about how the law should evolve to deal with ever more complex things like mm, AI. There's no attention to the psychological needs we research and, yes, the history that we need to know. There is no discussion also of the vast majority of non-Research One institutions who educate the vast majority of our nation. Institutions that have been disinvested in, even as the places where I spent my career and we're sitting here today. I went to Columbia, Stanford, Emory, Northwestern, the Ivies. They become ever more wealthy. Without our historically black colleges and universities, without our Hispanic serving institutions, without our Hispanic, uh, our Native American serving institutions, we fail at these levels. We fail in terms of diversity at the most elite levels. Medical care for black people would become even worse than it is without the HBCUs who continue to graduate undergraduates who then go on to medical schools across the country. Those institutions and others like them bridge the inequities in our K through 12 system and allow many more people to go to college and not necessarily Yale, but Yale is not the only kind of institution we should be supporting. I can discuss all of this in terms of race, but you know that this is also about class and the ongoing division between those things is one of the poisonous parts of our society today. To the degree that we continue to be a nation, our underfunding of higher education at every level is making our once world-class system of education, our democratic system of education, as David says, it is making it shrink and be unable to deal with the very things we need for our future, for our survival, climate change, Israel, Palestine, any number of hot points around the world that are just seeking answers. And these are the places where we should be working out those solutions. Those institutions with the most resources need to stop jockeying for number one through 10 and really think about the health of our entire higher education ecosystem. It is not just about the top 10 and the research they produce, which we desperately need. Different students have different needs. Different kinds of research need different kinds of institutions. We used to lead the world, which is why everyone came to us to go to school. We are not doing that anymore. The health of the Yales and the Harvards and the Northwesterns and the Emory's depends on the health of the Howards and the Spellmans and the Hispanic serving institutions and the native serving institutions. We can and should do better. In closure, it's my understanding, and maybe Rachel will tell us, that the Jesuit schools, the Jesuit higher education institutions out of Georgetown are taking their slavery and university work as an impetus to think across their own mini ecology 
of how they can distribute money differently, how they can rethink their mission. And that was my hope with Georgetown, that coming out of a Catholic tradition, fraud as it is, I was raised Catholic. Yes, I'm lapsed. You know the story. Okay. You're from New Orleans. How could I not be? So, but I had hope that that moral, at, at its best, that moral imperative would push this slavery and the university work forward. And I'm not sure, I haven't had time to really figure out what's going on with the Jesuits, but I'm hoping that they can serve as a beacon and a new path for this work that really is rooted in the a history of the most unequal systems, um, the most unequal systems we have had, and then push this work into its new place, which is not simply Thank you, but not simply publishing a book about it, but living into a new reality. And that's where this work started, is find out what the knowledge is, and then how are you going to walk differently because now you know. And so I really, again, thrilled to hear about this book about Yale, and let's do something. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Leslie. Beautifully said. Approximately 85% of all people in higher education in this country are in a public institution, and nearly 50% are in a community college. Just some numbers, uh, but that was beautiful. Uh, uh, Rachel, I think you just got your cue. <laughs> um, well, I am really thrilled and honored to be here um, with such an illustrious group of historians. Um, over the past seven years, I've been studying and writing about Georgetown, um, which has been in the forefront of this effort. You know, there are about 90 institutions, I think, right now, um, universities uh, who are studying um, their history in slavery. And Georgetown has been notable not only for grappling with its history, um, but also for taking concrete steps in the here and now um, to try to make amends. Um, the title of this panel, um, in part, is Reckoning with Slavery in U.S. Intellectual History. And I thought it would be instructive to tell you a bit about how this history was told in the past um, about Georgetown and a bit about what has changed and what has been happening. Um, first of all, though, I'm a journalist, and so my entry into this subject did not start with a find in the archives or a, a tantalizing footnote in a monograph. Um, as often happens with journalists, I kind of stumbled my way here. Um, in January of 2016, um, the CEO of a tech company sent an email uh, to a colleague of mine at the New York Times. Um, he was pitching an exclusive, um, a story about a 19th century slave sale, a mass sale of 272 men, women, and children, a sale that took place in 1838 and was organized by some of the nation's most prominent Catholic priests uh, to benefit Georgetown, uh, the nation's first Catholic institution of higher learning. Um, the email ended up with me because I had written a book about Michelle Obama's enslaved ancestors and had been thinking about slavery and how it shaped American families. And I was, you know, kind of a bit more familiar with generally with the you know, landscape of 19th century American slavery than my colleague was. Even so, I have to confess that I was flabbergasted. Priests enslaved people, priests bought and sold people, um, universities uh, relied on slave sales and slave labor. I, I was astounded. Of course, um, I soon discovered that historians are well aware <laughs> of, of this history, um, but it still felt urgent. <laughs> it felt urgent to me. Um, and it felt urgent to me because it was very clear that this story, um, this harrowing origin story of Georgetown's roots in slavery had almost completely faded from public memory. And so, as I started digging into the archives, I learned that um, what had become common knowledge, accepted knowledge about this history, um, was often actually belied by what was actually in the archives, even in the archives at Georgetown itself. And so a few things worth mentioning. 
Um, and and you kind of touched on this a bit with kind of the historiography, um, particularly in the uh, late 19th century, the image of the Catholic priest as the kindly master who worked to keep families together and only sold people, those disruptive and difficult people, um, until this mass sale when they turned um, to slavery for profit um, to save Georgetown um, in 1838. Um, in the archives, however, the records clearly and explicitly document the fact that priests were selling people, um, certainly in the late 1700s and probably earlier, and continue to do so um, through the early 1800s up to that period, that time in 1838. Um, another thing was this idea that the reliance on slavery and the profits um, from the slave sale in 1838 ended in 1838. And once again, Financial ledgers show that the money from the 1838 sale continued to come in well into the 1860s and that the Jesuits enslaved people and Georgetown relied on slavery until emancipation. And it turns out that the Jesuits wanted the money for more than just Georgetown. A lot of um, the focus, um, you know, was about this sale and how it um, was going to save Georgetown. And in fact, it did, right? Georgetown survived and thrived and is one of our elite universities. But the priests who organized um, that sale had a bigger idea in mind. Um, and they had a vision. Um, they wanted to establish um, a constellation of colleges, of Catholic colleges. They looked north and saw the waves of immigrants pouring into the cities um, and wanted to um, jumpstart this network, and they needed the money to do that. And finally, and perhaps most notably, at least to me, when I looked at how Georgetown's history had been told up to that point, um, was that I could see no significant effort to study and to tell the story of the enslaved people themselves. Um, without whom the university probably would not exist, at least not in the form that um, we see it today. Um, so that was kind of the state of things when I started um, looking at this history. Um, and I'd like to pivot a little now at this point to talk about how Georgetown has been wrestling with it. Um, I think it's really important to note um, that Georgetown has become a leader on this issue. There were a confluence of internal and external factors that I think contributed to this, and I hope that um, we'll get a chance to talk about that later. Um, but for now, I think it's important to say that um, Georgetown decided to start wrestling with this before I started writing it, before uh, my first story about this in April of 2016 and before students started protesting about it, um, which they did in the fall of 2015. Um, and here are some of the steps that the university has taken so far. Um, they've um, issued an apology for their participation um, in the American slave trade. They've changed building names, um, commemorating um, one of the um, in people who was enslaved um, and sold. Um, they established um, preference and admissions uh, for the descendants of people who were um, enslaved and sold by the Jesuits, effectively legacy status uh, for descendants. And there are and have been currently, um, there are descendants attending Georgetown now. They established a digital archive, um, surfacing some of those records that I relied on, which told a, a bit of a different story about Jesuit slaveholding so that um, scholars and descendants and the community could have easy access to them. Um, they've established a fund, they call it a reconciliation fund, um, where they're raising about $400,000 a year um, to benefit um, descendants and uh, projects that benefit descendants. Uh, the money comes from um, alumni and the first grants came out in the past academic year. They've also um, contributed um, millions of dollars to a um, project, a foundation that was established by the Jesuits and a group of descendants. Um, and the foundation, the Jesuits aimed to raise about $100 million um, to uh, for racial reconciliation projects and to benefit descendants as well. Um, and on campus, um, the administration announced this year that 
this history um, of uh, Jesuit slaveholding and how it benefited Georgetown would be taught in a seminar that is now mandatory um, for all undergraduates. Mm -hmm. um, the reception to all of this um, has been um, mixed, actually, um, and Georgetown's approach has evolved. Um, as Leslie pointed out, um, this network of colleges that I mentioned that grew up um, in the aftermath in the, in the 1830s um, are in different places about how they deal with it. Um, but mindful of time, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Mm. Thank you so much, Rachel. Uh, we we can put this off, but I do hope you'll say something about uh, when we get to the discussion about the Jesuits themselves and your own Catholic faith. You've been quite public about that, and I, I think it's quite interesting. But um, Craig, you're up. Uh, the author of the best book on this huge story. Uh, what's your current take? Um, wow. <laughs> I, I, no pressure. I, I went to um, <laughs> one of the Jesuit colleges founded after the Georgetown sale, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and with that personnel and um, a couple other Catholic schools in New York City, I'm not a lapsed Catholic. I'm I'm falling. <laughs> I'm not I'm not finished yet. I think, yeah, I think I can go. All right, first. Scott. Are you, uh, do we have four Catholics? Here? I know we've got the whole range. Uh, oh my, my my family is Catholic. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, Guilty. Right. <laughs> Want to get that on the table? I'm a lapsed Lutheran, so anyway. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so yes. Um, and I I I. I love Sister Catherine. And one of the things I loved about Sister Catherine was her commitment to alphabetical order. <laughs> I'm no longer sure about that. Um, I'm going to have to rethink that now. Um, but I just want to really talk about, um, thank David, um, thank the Center for inviting us. This has largely been a story over the last 20 plus years of persistence. And when I started working on this topic, um, I looked for every off ramp possible. Like, I wanted to stop doing this. And Ruth Simmons at Brown, um, when we, the courageousness of her leadership there embarrassed me into continuing. Um, Leslie's conference embarrassed me into finishing. Um, your work has embarrassed me into returning <laughs> to this. Um, and so what I want to do is really just talk a little bit about what's happening at MIT um, and some of the lessons I'm taking from our very specific personal story at MIT. Um, in 1985, on the eve of the Institute's 125th anniversary, um, a gift was actually given to the MIT Museum. And we've just learned about this thanks to one of the uh, museum curators, um, educational staff. Um, it was from Harold Edgerton, Doc Edgerton, one of the famous engineering teachers at MIT, really quite famous for his sort of um, living out the MIT motto of mind and hand, the hands-on research and learning that happens, that's supposed to happen in MIT labs. And what he had given was a spyglass, a telescope, um, to the museum. He was retiring. He passed away about five years later. Um, I never got to meet him, but he is sort of extraordinarily famous in MIT lore, um, extraordinary teacher. We named lots of stuff after him um, and quite deserving. That little spyglass, that little telescope was actually a gift to Edrington that he then sent the museum. And he had gotten it sometimes, sometime earlier. And he attached a note with it to the museum, sort of explaining or giving his sort of memories of how it came about. Um, it was given to him by an elderly Black man who had worked for the Institute. And he had kept it for quite some time. And according to his memory, is the Black man had come to MIT sometime in the late 19th century, perhaps early 20th century, and had a connection to William Barton Rogers, the founder of MIT. He'd come to MIT, um, to Massachusetts from Virginia. After Rogers' death, he had been hired by the Institute um, as a worker at the Institute, and eventually gave him this spyglass. 
The final, one of the most important sentences in the little note is that Edgerton also suspected that he was William Barton Rogers' slave. We've been struggling with this sort of history of MIT in lots of ways, because like most of these institutions, it's wrapped in a certain mythology. Um, MIT was founded in 1861, two days before the Civil War began, we get our charter. We're founded in a city, Boston, that has an active abolitionist minority. Um, we're founded in a state, Massachusetts, that had effectively outlawed slavery 80 years earlier. And we wrapped ourselves for much of our past in the story of our connections to that abolitionist tradition and the assumption that we had no ties to slavery. Well, that's quite untrue. Um, we didn't even offer a class until the Civil War was basically ending and um, the 13th Amendment was about to be passed. But in fact, actually, our founder, William Barton Rogers, was born in Philadelphia. Um, his father had actually escaped from Ireland, um, pushed out because of his liberalism on the Catholic question. He finishes his education at what's now, in fact, the University of Pennsylvania, um, and is hired as a professor at William and Mary, and only almost immediately, professor of science, almost immediately becomes a slave owner. Um, he moves into a building that actually has its own endowment of slaves. Mm -hmm. And so effectively, they became slave owners immediately, but they also begin to purchase slaves. Um, William Barton Rogers and one of his brothers goes to William and Mary. Rogers replaces his father on the faculty when his father passes in 1828. And the story of MIT begins, in fact, really right there when Rogers becomes a professor. He later becomes dean of faculty at the University of Virginia. Um, he's a slave owner for his entire time in the South, effectively. Um, in fact, owns a number of enslaved people. And one of his enslaved people, a young a man named Levi, also became his research assistant. Um, David, you point out in the in the new manuscript, I think it's Robert Park. Yeah. Her, Robert yeah. Parker. Yeah. yeah. With Solomon's. Yeah. Um, yeah. Research assistant. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, there's a moment where we actually discovered this. It's actually in a memorial that was held for Rogers in 1882 after he passed. Two presidents of MIT, John Runkle and Francis Amasa Walker, are actually presiding at this memorial, along with the president of the Alumni Association, several faculty leaders. Um, and they invite on the stage one of Rogers' best friends, Jedediah Hotchkiss from Virginia, who had been a major in the Confederate Army and had been the chief cartographer for the Confederacy. He was also Rogers' close personal friend. They worked together on geographical surveys of the Virginias. Um, Hotchkiss, when he comes up to eulogize his friend, begins talking about Rogers' enslaved man, Levi. He ridicules Levi in a Negro dialect and points out um, in the middle of that sort of performance that Levi was part of the group of people who really helped to establish geology as a science and a discipline in the United States. He does it with a kind of dismissive racist humor, but he still does it. And our students, who run the MIT and Slavery Project actually decided to just take him seriously for a minute. And what happens when we think about the place of enslaved people in the production of knowledge? What, what happens when we think about the university as a site that actually cannot move forward without them? What happens when we put them at the center of the story? And you end up in fact with multiple stories. Um, you end up with a really different sense of the rise of science and engineering in the 19th century, the disciplines that even in the sort of last 20 years of investigating histories of universities and slavery have managed to actually shield themselves um, as if they're not a part of that past when in fact there's it, you, slavery doesn't, need, well, let me put it differently. There's an engineering revolution that happens in the United States in the 40 years before the Civil War. The, MIT is the last sort of bright moment of that revolution, that two days before the Civil War. And it's only happening because of the slave economy. In Massachusetts, MIT is there because the cotton textile industry is there. 
and cotton textile manufacturers need engineers to build machines, design factories, improve efficiencies, eliminate inefficiencies, improve profit margins, et cetera. In the mid-Atlantic, engineering schools are there because of the sugar industry um, out of places like Williamsburg, Brooklyn, which at one point in the 19th century produced 80% of the world's sugar supply came out of that little spot. And sugar refiners need engineers. And in the inland um, counties and towns, the engineers are there because of the canal industry. But in each site, it's intimately related to slavery. The other part of the story that we sort of learned from that 1882 memorial for William Barton Rogers is the lost history of indigenous people in MIT. When Rogers came to Massachusetts from Virginia to found MIT, one of the things that he lacked was money. And he got it from two sources. One was the cotton textile manufacturers in the surrounding towns of Boston, right, the great textile industries of New England. The other was he lobbied the state legislature on a weekly basis for funds. He was there all the time. Um, he passed right by the black community in downtown Boston. He passed right by William Lloyd Garrison's Liberator. Um, he passed by all of that. To get, he was actually, in fact, at times lobbying the same exact private families, wealthy families that John Brown was lobbying mm -hmm. um, to help fund his raid on Harpers Ferry. Right? Um, Rogers sort of finally gets his victory the very year after MIT is founded, they're founded 1861, 1862, the Land Grant College Act is passed. Oh, no. mm. And each state gets tens of thousands of acres of indigenous lands in the West and South. Um, Massachusetts gets land from 82 indigenous nations. That land is then sold off and an account is created in the Massachusetts Treasury Two thirds of the account went to establish what, what is now the University of Massachusetts Amherst and its branch schools. <laughs> One third went to MIT, right? the hidden land grant school in the history of the land grant system. And so MIT emerges actually precisely because of the intersection of colonialism and slavery on the eve of the Civil War. And in many ways, it demonstrates, in fact, the power of those legacies as we move forward. Um, so <laughs> the last thing I'll say, which actually I just wanted to touch on your work um, because I think now it's actually also returning to us. For Yale, for Harvard, for Princeton, for MIT, because now we're actually now, we're now starting to get the names of the people who Rogers enslaved in Virginia, but also the names of people who are the faculty enslaved we also now have descendants. And when this story began, when we started doing this history 20 years ago and plus ago, one of the things that we never really thought that much about, I know I didn't, mm -hmm. was that we would be confronting people whose lives are directly affected by the research that we're doing. In the case of Georgetown, thousands of people. You know, I'm imagining at Harvard, that's gonna be in the hundreds very soon. At Yale, I, I, I suspect we're heading there too. We're in small numbers right now, but they won't remain small for long because in fact, what turns MIT into an internationally um, sort of prestigious institution is precisely its connections to colonialism and enslavement. Um, it's precisely the racial regimes of North America that makes us a great engineering school. If you think about the fact that you are our early classes are virtually all railroad engineers, which ties us intimately to Asian American history, the reversal of reconstruction in the South, and the militarization of the Western territories and the dispossession of indigenous people. Standing on the stage at that 1882 memorial, Francis and Massa Walker introduced, in fact, a um, basically a Virginia slaveholder Hotchkiss, the cartographer, he was actually a New Yorker. Yeah. Um, Rogers is a Philadelphian. And so what you ended up with at that stage is a Bostonian and a decorated Union Army general. Rogers had, had actually served, I mean, not Rogers, I'm sorry, Francis of Massa Walker had actually served in the Union Army. A Bostonian and a decorated Union Army general who advocated the destruction of indigenous people before he was president of MIT 
he was commissioner of the Bureau of Indian Affairs and largely constructed the reservation system in the United States, who advocated the destruction of indigenous people, invited a New Yorker turned Virginian and Confederate officer to the podium to eulogize MIT's first president, the Philadelphia born founder of the Boston College, who had spent decades as a Virginia slave owner. Founded two days before the Civil War in an abolitionist city, MIT couldn't be more tied to slavery. And the truth is that the story of the American Academy is the story of American slavery and the story of American colonialism. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I want to I wanna pose a question here as quick as I can, but Hope McGrath, I'm going to put you on the spot. You're going to hate me. But to follow on what Craig, the story Craig just told, we have almost, well, Craig, as you know, you've read our manuscript. Yeah. We have almost, not an identical, but a very similar story here with the great scientist, Benjamin Silliman, who brought scientific education into American universities, ran a huge study uh, of sugar production in Louisiana on a federal grant <laughs> and had an assistant who helped him here on the faculty. And he gave these instructions to that assistant. And we made this the epigraph on the book. When you go to Louisiana, he told his assistant, open your eyes and ears to every fact connected with the actual condition of slavery everywhere, but do not talk about it. Hear and see everything, but say little. Now, when that quote emerged from a letter, or was it a, I forget precisely, I think our, our little group said, that's the epigraph. <laughs> But Hope, would you briefly in some way tell the story of Robert Park, who was, do you mind, was Benjamin Silliman's assistant, not unlike? Robert, uh, we have a mic, Hope. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Robert M. Park was a, a Black man who was born in the early 19th century, um, uh, and he was identified in city uh, New Haven City directories as a sexton or a janitor assigned to the lecture room. Uh, I was interested in him because in a, a black graduate, an early, not too early, but a 19th century black graduate of Yale uh, who wrote a uh, two volume history of African American people called an African abroad. He wrote a history and, and had a lot of um, details about New Haven black residents. And he referred to Robert Park as a mathematician and an astronomer. And uh, Charles Warner, who is in the audience and a member of the working group, had keyed me into that. And I thought, well, that's interesting. In the Black community and Black historians um, recognized him as a mathematician and astronomer, but he's listed as a, as a sexton. And there are many biographies that have been written about Benjamin Silliman. He is responsible for really promoting scientific education in the United States and the first science professor at Yale. Uh, in none of the secondary works, none of the biographies of Silliman is, is Robert Park mentioned. But in Silliman's own diary, he actually wrote multiple times about Robert Park. And when he was invited to give a series of prestigious lectures in Boston, uh, he took Robert Park with him for months, several months they spent in Boston. And he wrote uh, many detailed diary entries about how they prepared slides together, prepared specimens, how um, they were, uh, how he assisted him in all of his scientific work. And when they made their presentation, their lecture, um, Silliman wrote, uh, he is considered by the audience, a sub professor, he does marvelously. And I just want to thank Professor Wilder um, for his comments. And, and I, it, it makes we didn't me plan this. <laughs> no, I think it's, it's really such an important story to see it happening across institutions. And this is not a one off. This is mm -hmm. um, the labor that goes into creating knowledge, the labor that goes into scientific and, and discovery. Uh, that labor was done by someone. Uh, and as you point out, it wasn't all done by the person who gets the credit for it. So it's a great story. Thank you. And I can I just say, totally. thing? I think one of the best teaching moments in the MIT and slavery project was when the students asked, well, what if we actually take this seriously? Right? Because they're all science and engineering majors. And we don't know Levi's last name. But we do know that he filled in for Rogers. Mm -hmm. When European scientists came to the Virginias to actually um, do geological tours and to do surveying, it was actually Levi who often um, led those tours. Um, and that's partly what Hotchkiss was ridiculing, 
right? That that scene. But in fact, actually, that was Levi's role. We also know that, you know, Benjamin Bradley mm -hmm. at the um in Annapolis, who was a young black man who was owned um and used in a print shop in Annapolis, um, who actually showed extraordinary technical skill, was eventually purchased by one of the professors at um the Naval Academy. Um, he ends up purchasing his freedom basically by designing and building um, steam engines for midshipmen right? um, and is ultimately with the help of one of the mass mathematicians and um, people in Annapolis um, ultimately basically employed in the labs there and continues. This is a story that actually you know, runs through the history of engineering, runs through the history of science, but in part, in fact, the prestige of science and engineering rise with slavery, because that's where the funding is coming from. But also they rise with the intellectual labor of enslaved people. Well, we'll there are many other stories that will connect to this in our work here too, but we'll spare you that. Um, Rachel, would you mind saying at least a few words on this Jesuit and Catholicism question? Anyone else here wants to pick up on that, go right ahead. Um, I, I do want to tap into, um, well, I, I, it looks like I'm the only practicing Catholic here on the panel, so I can talk about that. Um, but I did want to um, tap into some of the the points that were made here. Um, when I um, one of the things that's interesting about Georgetown, um, there's there's so many things that relate um, that resonate with me. One is this mythologizing, right? On the other hand. Um, as I mentioned, Georgetown really did decide to lean into this, and there are these internal and external factors. Some of it is the Catholicism, right? Um, I think um, for the president and the leadership um, who were inspired, as I mentioned before, my stories before the student protests by the racial reckoning happening at the time, um, you know, uh, the, the police violence, um, the killings of black men, um, Dylan Roof, the massacre that they they that they started thinking about the institution and its own history, so very much connected to that. But also to this idea of, as Catholics, um, is there a way in which we can't really or should not turn away? Um, whether that we have to um, acknowledge and reconcile um, with the sin that's been committed, and I think. Um, when I first started writing about this, um, some of the first institutions um, that started really grappling with this in a concrete, not let's establish a working group and a report, but in a concrete way, were institutions with religious foundations. And we often talked about that. They were seminaries. Um, they were some of these Catholic institutions. So that was some of the internal factors, I think, that... Um, that that made Georgetown willing um, to to really take this on in a way um, that other institutions might not have. There were these external factors too, though, right? Um, when I wrote my first story, there were um, three descendants, um, about, well, I should say a handful of descendants who had been identified. We suspected that there were more. And to talk about the mythologizing, when the CEO um, who reached out to me about this reached out to Georgetown and said, oh, wow, 272 people are sold, you've changed names, what happened to the descendants? A member of their working group said, oh, they all died. Mm. And he said, they all died? <laughs> they all died. He's like, nearly 300 people and they all died? And in fact, he was just so outraged that it just seemed so ludicrous to him. Um, you know, he's a wealthy white guy who, in fact, had not really been involved in racial justice or social justice issues, but he loved Georgetown. He was a Georgetown alum. And he said, you know, this institution kind of owes its existence to these people. And so he said, I'm going to hire a team of genealogists. We're going to find some people. So by the time I wrote that first story, there were a handful that his team of genealogists had identified. We thought there were more. We posted, wrote, a, you know, what we call a call out um, alongside my first story saying, are you connected to this? Here's the passenger manifest from the ship that carried many of these people, first and last names, a, a remarkable document. Um, do you recognize these families? Are you Black and Catholic and from Southern Maryland? Are you Black and Catholic? That's where the plantations were. Are you Black and Catholic from this town in Maringouin? 
Today, as um, Craig pointed out, there are more than 6,000 um, descendants who have been identified. And these folks, and when I talk about the external factors, um, you know, these folks, um, you know, I like to say wept, raged, and organized. And they really pressured um, Georgetown, which was willing to to take steps, but really pressured to Georgetown and really pressured um, the Jesuits to take action. Um, and, and going back to David's question about the Catholicism, one of the really interesting things um, when you're writing about these families, and my book ends up telling the story of one family in particular, um, was that many of these families, enslaved and sold by the Jesuits, remain Catholic after the Civil War. Um, and, and that's a kind of notable thing because thousands of people left the Catholic Church, Black people after emancipation. The Catholic Church was um, segregated um, in terms of seating, in terms of festivities. The bishops were mealy mouth, to put it nicely, um, in terms of how they described what had happened. Um, but a lot of these families, um, for them, um, the church, I like to think anyway, did not belong to these sinful white men, right? Um, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit belonged to them too. And not only did they stay, um, but they many of them became lay leaders. Some of them became religious leaders, and they worked to change the church to make it more reflective of and responsive to um, Black Catholics. Um, and so um, oftentimes um, when people realize that I'm a Black Catholic, and it's so random because it had nothing to do with how this came to me, they say, you know, people often want to shake me by the shoulders and say, how could you stay? <laughs> and um, I would say faith is a mysterious thing, right? Um, but also I think, you know, um, these families, you know, I grew up in, a, in New York um, in an Irish and Italian Catholic church where I did not see myself really, you know, and I see myself in it now um, in the origin story of how the church was built and um, and the story of these families that, um, despite what happened, um, held on to it. Well, thank you. Uh, Scott, before I turn this over to the audience for just a few questions, we're going to run a little over our six feet in time. Um, I won't have everybody answer this, although I'd love to hear it. This is your first book. You worked on it for years. That's not a criticism. We've all worked on books for years. There's, um you have to make a lot of judgments about a lot of people, including Ulrich Phillips, et cetera, et cetera. What has this taught you about how you make judgments about people, about the past? Because we've, we're all doing that here now on a very sensitive subject for the institutions we work for. Mm -hmm. um, do you think you've learned anything about how we judge these people or how you, you judge them? Or do, have you just forgotten that you just... Right, what you see? Um, I I guess I try to write what I see, but I try to. My goal is always to enter into a sympathetic understanding of the the people that I'm writing about. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Which is a little weird for me because a lot of the people that I'm writing about have been demonized recently. Um, you oh, know, sure. <laughs> you know, Ulrich Phillips is not like a historical hero for many people. No, William Dunning is not. We all we all go use his papers, but he's not. Um, <laughs> and and so it's kind of an interesting problem. And so what I generally try to do is, you know, try to understand anyone I'm studying. What is the world that they're working in? What are the mm -hmm. problems mm -hmm. that they are facing? And grappling with and how are they approaching and trying to work through those problems mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. it seems to me that that's how we all sort of fumble through life um some of us make uh good decisions along the way many of us make many mistakes and many bad decisions along the way um some of us have sort of a litany of, of bad, what seem like bad decisions in retrospect mm -hmm. along the way um and so try to understand them as fully as uh, I can and what they're they're trying to do. So, you know, for Ulrich Phillips, trying to figure out where is he coming from in the late 19th, early 20th century? How is he trying to understand slavery and the plantation 
at this moment of progressivism. Um, mm-hmm. And he's he's doing really interesting things. He's comparing the plantation to a settlement house, for example, um, and, and trying to, to see the plantation as this like weirdly conservative, but also progressive economic and social institution. And so try, trying to understand like, where is he coming from as he's he's working his way through this problem? Mm-hmm. And also, you know, taking these figures who it's easy to demonize seriously as scholars in the same way that um, Craig was talking about taking Levi seriously as a scholar. Yeah. Um, we need to take all of these people seriously as scholars, um, see what the framework that they're working in, what the ideals that they have and where they fall short of those mm-hmm. scholarly mm-hmm. or sort of human um, ideals. And um, I also try, you know, as you said at the beginning, to keep a sense of humility um, about myself, my own, um, you know, contradictions and constraints and um, insufficiencies as a, as a person, um, as I try to look at these other people and how they've gone through life. Great answer. Uh, and we even love to hate now the great pioneers of the 50s and 60s and 70s who revolutionized this field. In a graduate seminar, yeah. Yeah. good I, thing some of those folks are dead. I've got pages and pages on they, Eugene, they Eugene Genovese, if daughter, you want to read a student, yeah, right? no, None of us wants to hang around too. No, no, you don't want to be there when your book is treated in some seminar in 30 years or 40 years. Uh, let's open this up for a, a couple of questions, if we could. We have a mic. Adi, you're first. Raise your hand so I can, yes, back here. Okay, and well, go ahead, Adi. I'd like to ask all of you about examples of how you diffused really painful discussions on these subjects between, well, let's say interracial discussions, but also just, I just, Rachel, I have to ask you, are you saying that these 272 people were not slaves off a boat who they put up an auction, but people they had had in their pastoral care, who they had you know, brought through their first communions, that kind of thing? Uh, yeah. Leslie, you might want to, you ran that program for years. At so, yeah, I mean, <laughs> one of the things that we did was um, with that program in particular was we had guidelines for engagement with each group that was talking through these histories and bringing it ever closer to the present. So um, we, in doing that, you know, it, it's a funny thing to say, but when you start in the past with slavery, which it's possible people are connected to, but most of the people weren't that connected to, you then, that's a place where you can begin to practice talking across your differences of age, of race, of experience, of status in university. But we did have these guidelines that people could point to and say, if things started to get heated and say, well, you know, let's let's remember that we are all learners, we are in discussion, this is difficult, those kinds of things. We had, in those groups, we had facilitators who also modeled, uh, you know, cross-race, cross-generation, cross-status, all those things. And so they modeled, and people, but, you know, people agreed to come together and to really think about how do I communicate? How do I talk to someone who's coming in with this view that I, I can't stand? I mean, you just, you, you, we all, we really need to work it like a muscle. And then you need to think about, like, there's some people I'm not going to have a conversation with. It's just not going to go well because I, there's not enough common whatever. You know, I'm even listening to certain podcasts, for example, I found one podcast that I could listen to with on an issue that I really disagree with. But listening to that person, I could hear that they were struggling with what this all meant. And I appreciate the struggle. And so I try we try to model appreciating that struggle when you are face to face with someone and you're struggling and they're struggling. How can you come together and appreciate that you're both working through something difficult? The yeah. other th- one final thing, sometimes it blows up. And then <laughs> how do you repair? Like, you know, often these days something blows up and people can't see their way back. And 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 I think we really have to think about you can't keep voting everyone off the island, you know. Um th- there's a book by a woman, Sarah Schulman, called Conflict is Not Abuse. You know, that has a lot of stuff in there about people going through really difficult moments with each other, realizing they're in conflict, but not taking it all the way to 
a, a place that's irreparable. Either the accusation you have, you know, done this, or the the you know that this is something you cannot come back through, from because you said that. And you know, in, in university communities, people with tenure, nobody's going anywhere. We know these departments or people have done that thirty years ago, and they can't speak. What is that? So anyway, it's it's really about thinking through how do you stay in community. You may or may not come to a new place together, but you still have to be together. It's anyway. This is a. Just were, were you briefly a psychology major? <laughs> You're pretty good at it. Uh, this question right back here. Yeah, wait for the mic so our audience outside can hear you. Hi, thank you. You all were were fantastic. Um, my question is for Rachel Swarns. Um, with regards to uh, Georgetown, do um, I wanted to ask you what their endowment is, and then also, if you know, and then also, you speak about <laughs> you speak about quick, quick look it up. <laughs> you speak about the um, the enslaved descendants that they've located, and you spoke about the reconciliatory um, methods that are that are being put in place now were the family members consulted were they asked about what they thought would be helpful in restoring them um so i am just not quick enough on my phone um georgetown's endowment often what georgetown will say is that they don't have this endowment that's that's kind of you know that they are not um as wealthy as Yale or uh, of the Ivy. So obviously it's an elite institution. Um, and so I, I mentioned that the reception, so it is both true that Georgetown has been in the forefront of this um, movement among universities to take concrete steps. It is also true that, you know, it the reception has been mixed. You know, there are thousands of descendants. People have very different views about the role um, and this, what Georgetown has done and the steps that it has taken. Georgetown has um, tried to involve um, descendants and um, Jack DeJoya, the president actually, you know, flew out to Louisiana to personally meet people, flew out uh, to Washington state to personally meet descendants. Um, and I think most descendants feel like there have been important first steps taken here um, by Georgetown and, um, and and by the Jesuits. But there's a lot of a lot of division. There are a lot of questions. People, some people feel like you know they haven't been considered enough, um, that they haven't been consulted enough, that the steps just aren't enough. Um, and then there are others who really feel. Um, like this whole effort has given their lives um, a kind of meaning and purpose um, that um, they had never imagined. I also want to say that, you know, descendants have not just been waiting around for the institutions to do things, too. Um, one of the things that has been most, um, all of this, I, and I should say all of this has been astonishing to me because, of course, we're in 2023, but in 2016, the idea that an institution that we would be talking about institutions, you know, do and and there's language issues. Georgetown wouldn't say reparations, okay, but that institutions would be actively doing this kind of work and talking about money and not just reports seemed really hard to imagine. But these descendants um, now have been basically doing the work of, you know, stitching their families back together. They're they're holding reunions, um, they're getting to know each other, Zoom calls, et cetera, um, and really trying to prod um, the institution um, to do more. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> 2.3 3 billion, she said. <laughs> 2.3 3 billion, okay. I'll take one or two more, but we gotta make them fairly succinct here. Michael Moran. I wanted, in, if we're doing intellectual history and reckoning, one to bring into this space and thank by name Anthony Dugdale, J.J. Fuser, J. Castro, uh, J. Kelso de Castro Alves, and the Amistad Committee, who in 2001 wrote a report and to think about what could have been had the institution taken it seriously and not made it quiet. It was not quiet. There was a town meeting, it was in the New York Times and to think about what could have been and what the sort of responsibility given that time for, as you said, Dr. Harris, that this be not just 
words, but action and sort of what, and I wanted to raise, we, we have in the context of Georgetown, a lot of embodied work, recognizing that much of it came through petition and struggle and, and also again, honoring the folks who did that report. But I wonder if folks could uh, offer some other thoughts on what the embodied action should be, since that's obviously going to be a, a major conversation around this campus. Could I just take another question or two, and then we'll we'll try to have a quick collective quick collective answer? Uh, right over here, if we could, Deja, I'm sorry, run you all over the room. But... <laughs> and then I, I, I've seen a hand back in that corner now for at least 10 minutes. So. So, yes, ma'am, in row five. I consider myself an ancestor. I'm a descendant. Uh -huh. I'm all connected um, through through several means. I'm sorry. Um, um, Irish last name. Um, yet I have uh, both West Indian and uh, let's see, North Carolina Cherokee Indian, um, and I've traced some of my ancestors um, because I needed to. Uh, because of all of the uh, cultural and the ethnic difference in myself, only to find out, yeah, I've had a whole family uh, that began here from slavery. And so I honor them in all ways that I can. And, and I think the biggest way is to acknowledge, know, search my history. That ties into who I am. So having said all that, I want to quickly go to what Mike already alluded to. My generation wants to say this, period, reparations. And why aren't we talking more and more about what we need to do to level the playing field that was deliberately made so that the, the inequality and the equity that I'm experiencing now in 2023 is absolutely ridiculous. Thank and you, I, and uh, we 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 uh, we're, we're aware of that question, <laughs> more than aware. And uh, okay, okay. Uh, all right. Why don't we? All right. I'm being told we got to wrap this up. So. Well, those two uh, possible answers here, and yeah. then we're going to have a reception upstairs. <laughs> those two things are related, of course, yes. right? 2001 reparations. Um, I didn't put this context in, but the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, a lot of this work grew out of a 1990s reparations movement as well um, that was more in the public and that pointed fingers at Brown and other institutions. We, yeah, you're, yeah, absolutely. I, I, this is my pessimism. I mean, you know, as I think I hinted, and I'll say explicitly, 20 plus years in, what we have is every elite institution feels that they have to do a project, mm -hmm. but they do not feel they have to do repair beyond renaming buildings and establishing a scholarship fund, the things they always do. That's one way. The other thing though, again, is that I, I do not think that any single institution can actually solve this. It has to be what the Jesuits are trying to do, which is common, a, a, a communal, a, a, a much broader thing. And you know, to the degree that the most elite institutions have the most money and the organizational whatever it takes to get institutions together, the half, the political capital, all those things, maybe they should be the ones to lead some kind of effort. In terms of repair, is it repair to specific descendants or is it repair in terms of building capacity at other institutions? So I'm like, why doesn't Harvard and Yale share some of that development uh, know-how and help some HBCUs and Hispanic serving institutions and native serving institutions build up their endowments? Give them some uh, some hours, some pro bono hours from their development office to to build that. We had uh, what's her name, the former Mrs. Bezos, um, dropping little gifts here and there. She can't get rid of her money; it keeps growing, but she still can't quite save us from ourselves. You know, I mean, that's another way, of course, share the money, but 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 be clear that doing the research and having the nice book and doing the project and wow, our students discovered that we had slaves. That's not enough. And at this point, it has become a way that that is the only repair. 
And, you know, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm head up because of what we've just gone through with those three university presidents and just what we're seeing about the ways that the university system writ large has been and continues to be, and now flagrantly in our faces, undone. And repair is part of it for this piece, but it is a broader question of what are we really going to do about this? Or are we just going to keep hiring PR people to help us out, which, as we saw, is not going to work. So 2023 is about to leave, 2024 is coming in, where are we going? Um, I think we have to, there are many forms of repair. I would just add that many, many different kinds of repair. That's perhaps not news to most of us, but uh, deep, deep in that question lies enormous comparison. Repair regimes of all kinds have been attempted all over the world in all kinds of different cultures and societies because of all kinds of different problems. And one of the problems sometimes with the repair issue in the United States is we think we're new at this. Well, we are new at it, but we're, we're the only place doing this. Uh, it's an American thing. No, it's an international, global, human thing. Uh, nations have been trying to figure out how to repair from uh, oppression, massive warfare, and genocide for a very long time. And uh, if we focus only on our own situation, our own navels, uh, we make a big mistake. But that's just a uh, thought for the moment. Uh, listen, we have a lovely reception upstairs, and I know there are other hands, and I'm sure our guests will be happy to discuss your question with you. But I want to end by simply thanking uh, uh, the President Salovey's office, uh, the Yale and Slavery Research Project, the Binding Career Book and Manuscript Library, and last but not least, um, the Belonging at Yale office, uh, who all helped sponsor this event, as did the Macmillan Center. Thank you very much. And thank you all for coming. And please join us right upstairs for a reception. Thanks. Thank you.